All right, I'll invite uh, Trevor up from the Mosquito Group. So we, oh, sorry, I think oh, okay. yeah, <laughs> no? it's on, it's on. Uh, I, I can just project. No, I'm uh, sorry, uh, I'm sorry, I have to use the mic. Hello? Hello? That's it. Yep, no. Nope. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Hello? Your <laughs> the mic was working. Well, sorry about that. This is the Aedes aegypti mosquito, which was the subject of our uh, uh, very uh, interesting discussion. And one of the things that came out of it, uh, thanks to your, the moderator's uh, mosquito bias, uh, was that one shouldn't assume that something like the mosquito uh, is, a is, is inherently a polluted image that everybody will agree with. And one of our members, this is uh, David Inou Inouye's uh, finger here, and he's holding a mosquito, which actually provides a really valuable function uh, in uh, pollinating alpine flowers. So that was something uh, that, uh, that we all learned and was quite interesting. So the object of uh, our discussion was, of course, the introduction of a genetically modified uh, 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 Aedes aegypti, which would uh, be used to suppress dengue fever, which is spreading rapidly in uh, which is endemic in the developing world and which has the potential uh, to spread along with other tropical diseases uh, through climate change uh, in uh, America, in the Fl Florida Keys specifically. Um, the company Oxitec had conducted several uh, 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 sort of introductions of the, of the technology uh, with, uh, uh, with several different engagements of the public, uh, and, uh, and, but was encountering uh, resistance uh, in the Florida Keys. So we explored that within the context of everything that had preceded uh, uh, with the various tools and con concepts that we had uh, the previous uh, day. And uh, what we identified as the problems for Oxitec uh, were the following. Um, the target populations in the Keys were not entirely sure about the rationale for the introduction of the mosquito, given that the last case of dengue identified was in 2010. Um, there was also a concern that, uh, and OX513A is the, the specification number, um, uh, it was, wasn't actually focused on the, the, the mechanism of GM, um, but the potential uh, uh, environmental effects uh, of a release, uh, which were sort of unquantified, unknown, uh, hadn't really been adequately addressed. And one of the, one of the key uh, problems in addressing uh, uh, th uh, th those concerns about risk were that was a sense that the CDC, the EPA, and the FDA, who were all collaborating on a risk assessment, um, were not actually addressing the science communication part of it. They were just maybe doing the science and um, with the, the consequence that everything looked like it was, the res it was falling on Oxitec. Oxitec was responsible for the whole shebang, uh, and uh, people had uh, uh, concerns about that. Um, the other thing is that though Oxitec did engage in social science research, there was a feeling that they needed better survey methodology uh, or that they needed to be more conscious of the, uh, social, uh, the social science literature, which we'll get to in a moment. And there was also an interesting problem raised uh, about uh, the fact that Oxitec is a company who has interests in both disease and in agriculture, that that could be, you know, uh, the, the, that they could be perceived as, as, as uh, throwing a Trojan horse into the agriculture debate uh, through the introduction of this mosquito. And that was something that hadn't really been thought about and I thought it was an excellent point. Our conclusions uh, was that, uh, uh, you know, sounds obvious but not necessarily, be clear about the goals uh, of, uh, of science communication. Um, uh, understand your audiences. Um, don't assume we know how people feel. Uh, uh, and that's the sense that, uh, as somebody uh, pointed out, uh, uh, actually it might be redolent of summer for some people to get bitten <laughs> by mosquitoes. Um, uh, improbable, but not uh, impossible. Um, and uh, uh, how can scientific evidence 
uh, help to address how people, these people feel? I mean, can we bring good science uh, and frame it in such a way that it addresses uh, uh, their concerns? But of course, in order to do that, we need to know their concerns, hence better social science surveys to begin with. Um, don't, uh, or the other thing was that um, uh, an important point raised was that uh, the, we should not understand the value of consent. Um, and this requires considerable prior engagement. I mean, you don't sort of spring something, oh, hey, two weeks from now, we're going to be doing this. Uh, and, here's, and here's a bunch of science that says it's OK. Um, uh, this it requires laying a much stronger ground, uh, a stronger um, uh, a foundation in the community for these kinds of actions. At the same time, don't uh, assume that a successful intervention somewhere else can, will necessarily be replicated uh, uh, in, in another environment. And as uh, uh, our presenter, uh, Sophia, said to me, she said, scientists have a tendency to want to replicate what works, uh, yet the uh, you know, audiences and populations and cultures are heterogeneous, so they, they, it, things don't necessarily translate uh, uh, in, a, in a simple fashion. Um, and of course, the, the key point that uh, we will elucidate a little bit more is that we absolutely must use the existing uh, research and so, so social science, seek out experts, and stop reinventing the wheel, uh, and stop making the same mistakes that have been made so many times before. So our recommendations uh, are pretty straightforward. And this was a, actually a really, this was this, the signal part of the, the discussion, is that um, somebody needs to manage the, the science uh, communication process. Um, and so we emphasize that three times, but who will manage it? And that is, the key, that, that is one of the key issues that, that came out of it. Um, we, if, if there's one thing I think, and I, if I can risk speaking for everybody in, my, uh, in the session, um, uh, if there is one outcome we would really like to see, uh, really underlined and italicized and bolded, is that there is some academic center, association, or institution become the repository for best and worst practices in science communication, especially with respect to stakeholder proceedings. And in doing, creating that kind of center, uh, we need, it, it is, is, is vital to creating a culture of science communication such that the lessons of social science research are a starting point for formulating public engagement. Uh, uh, around potentially controversial science and not an afterthought. Uh, so, um, uh, as, as it was pointed out, you know, we all need toolkits, but who's going to provide the toolkit? The research is there, but who's going to access it? Who's going to supervise it? Who's going to call it in? Uh, um, that requires, I think, institutional leadership uh, or association leadership to anybody who might be a member of the American Association for Advancement of Science that's here. All the National Academies <laughs> of Science. <laughs> Great, thank you. Anyone in our mosquito group who would like to add something? Yeah, George. Um, just, just to um, clarify a little bit, if you go back to, I think, your second slide there, um, you, man you managed to frame the discussion by calling it the Oxitec project. Mm -hmm. And I think I would have called it the mosquito abatement program, because they're the ones who invited in Oxitec, because that, that to me automatically sets up a whole different that's um, great. That's great. impression. Um, but that's, that's I think, all pressures. I have. Deadline pressures. <laughs> <laughs> great. Anything? Yeah. Dietram, question? So I'm wondering to which degree, I, I like the managing the communication process. I'm wondering to which degree in your group the issue came up of us not being the only communicators. If I were to communicate on this issue and if I wanted to do something against this particular technology, I would try to frame it in a way that evokes an underlying cultural schema and that is being bitten by an insect that's genetically modified, right? And Spider-Man comes up immediately. <laughs> and, 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 and playing, and again, this is, this is Bambi, right? This is, we all have it in our heads and even if we don't actively use it, I can activate it very, very quickly with a good frame. Um, so to which degree that you're managing the communication process talk about being ready for a much larger communication environment um, that will frame this issue in a, in a way that plays maybe much more successfully than anything we've heard just now to, to these underlying schemas that all of us, even in this room, share. Well, that's a great point. Uh, so, uh, and uh, it, to be honest, it, I hadn't, it hadn't occurred to me, I'm not sure whether it occurred to other people, that this is a Spider-Man 
could be a Spider-Man issue, a Spider-Man story. Um, but one of the things we did talk about, we talked about more sort of the, the general processes than how a story might uh, specifically evolve through certain centers of communication. But, uh, and I see Dan coming up. Um, but Dan actually made a great point that we need to first identify the kind of know that within a particular community that's responding to this issue, we need to understand where the nodes of information, who the nodes of information are, how and what are they communicating to other people, and, uh, uh, and, what, and then formulate strategies to deal with that afterwards. So um, we never really got to the point of how would we deal with the Spider-Man issue. That makes me want to have the, yeah, the genetically, I, I want to be Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> it was also, but <laughs> we, we also talked about a carbon sequestering mos mosquito that we might, at least I proposed developing one. Um, so I patented it. But the, <laughs> this, on this question, uh, I mean, this is a general point, but there's a lot, there should be, and there is, a lot of concern about misinformers and misinformation. Um, one thing to realize is that um, the world is so filled with misinformation um, that it's got to be the case that most of it has no effect. Um, if you go onto the internet, you can find misinformation on just about anything. Um, the question is, why does information sometimes have such a tremendous effect? Um, it's probably not because it was misinformation, because if it was, then all the other kinds of misinformation about contrails and about the conspiracies of this and that sort would also be having an effect. Um, with Dietram, I think we did anticipate a bit what Dietram had in mind, because um, one of the points was that if you do a good job in managing the science communication environment, um, and in particular in the stakeholder settings, um, if you don't just try to impose something on people, if, if you enter into their lives in a way that shows that, that you are respectful of and, and solicitous of their stake in what you're doing, then you have a community that's less likely to be vulnerable to being misinformed less likely to be latching on to um, the kinds of things that people who want to discredit um, what the best information has to say um, are doing. And so, I mean, you can't stop the misinformers. You can't stop them. But you, you can do something, I think. You can, you can probably give, vaccinate your community, as it were, with, with a kind of appropriate approach to, uh, to handling these kinds of issues generally that makes it less likely they'll be confused um, by the people who try to do that. I could pass on uh, something that I heard at lunch yesterday about the Brazil introduction. And that was that uh, the people doing the introduction went around the communities from house to house with a box full of uh, mosquitoes. Of course, the mosquitoes are all male, so they don't bite. And so people were invited to put their hands in the, their arms in the boxes, and they didn't get bitten. And, and so this, if, if this was true, what I heard at lunch yesterday, that was a great example of uh, forestalling the, uh, the Spider-Man issue. I'll vouch for it. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Chris Grace. Is this on? Um, yeah, I can attest to that. So that was part of community engagement. And one of the points that I think was also raised that I just wanted to flag up was really um, engaging citizens in a more interactive way, so promoting more of a dialogue. So having those more interactive events was a part of that. Um, but also community advisory group is something that we've done in Florida, um, ways to try and get the community involved um, directly in terms of communicating the message to fellow members. So I think that's something that was really useful too. Thanks. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I'm really curious about this um, male mosquito box that you're taking around. I'm very curious what happens if those people know that male mosquitoes don't bite. What happens when you present it that way and say, look, they're safe, they won't bite you, but, but that's nothing you did. It's not really related to what, what you're presenting. Yes, it is. Yeah. The, Can I explain this? Oh, sure. Tamar. Uh, yeah. Can you come up to the microphone, Tamar, please? Thanks. 
I'm afraid I'm responsible for this because I was the one who was talking out of school at lunch. But um, I, I was in Brazil and I met some of the people from Oxitec and from Sao Paulo, the academics who were responsible for this. And the reason it is relevant is because the release of the mosquitoes is only male mosquitoes. So it's not like they're pretending that they genetically modified this mosquito not to bite. It's that they're bringing around male mosquitoes to demonstrate that they don't bite. So they bring the mosquitoes, in fact, I believe they actually brought the ones that were genetically modified, and then they would stick their own hands into the boxes and ask, you know, especially kids, if they want to stick their hand in the box, well, mosquitoes, nobody got bit. And that was part of a very uh, long-term and sophisticated public engagement that really won over the community and was instrumental in the success of the project. Great, thank you. Other questions or comments on this session? All right, thanks, Trevor.